Greetings AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here. We're going to be taking a look at our final video for the very robust and long topic 9.7 where we first introduced the idea of polar curves and we start injecting a little bit of calculus in them. And I've got a really good problem here for you in example 10 that merges not just an older idea from earlier maybe in BC, but an idea that goes all the way back to uh, unit four from uh, AB calculus and um, merges it into this one nice problem. And it makes it a, a very applicable problem for what one could see on the AP exam possibly. So let's take a look at how particle motion can interweave a bit with polar. So what we've got here in our problem is a polar curve r is given by the equation r equal theta plus the cosine of theta. And we know that theta is going to lie only between 0 and 2 pi for the purpose of this curve. A particle travels along this polar curve r so that its position at any time t is given by x of t, y of t. And we also know that d theta dt is a half. We're asked to find dx dt at the instant theta is 5 pi over 6 and then interpret the meaning of our answer within the context of the problem. And as you can see it is a calculator active problem uh, only because it's a little bit nasty with some of the evaluations that you have to do at the end. Now as I said before this problem is really layered with a lot of very interesting calculus. And I always ask my students on the surface, you know, what, what kind of question does this look like? And I like to elicit responses. What, what other topic from AB Calculus does this give you some kind of um, fond or maybe not so fond memories? And the, the, the answer that I try to elicit is it looks like a related rate question. And I say that because you're given a rate of change of theta with respect to t, and you're asked to find a totally different rate. If you remember, related rates were those story problems that you worked out, um, oh, maybe halfway through or so the first semester of calculus that were kind of challenging from time to time. In fact, if you're one of my students, it's pretty much shortly after we do related rates and take the test, I read you a book about Grover. Maybe that rings a bell. So what you're going to do with this problem is try to work it so that you have an equation that really contains this all-important value of x. Because we can't really find a dx dt unless we have an equation for x. And so you have to really reach into your polar parametric bag of tricks and realize that x is always defined as r times the cosine of theta. Right? That's never gone away. What we do with this particular problem here is we use the given r, which is the polar curve, theta plus cosine theta, and we're going to multiply that by cosine theta. After this, we are free to start taking the derivative. Now, think about this. What variable are we going to take this derivative with respect to? or to what variable shall we take the derivative by? So if you see the fact that both of these derivatives are with respect to t, that's got to be your giveaway, that you're going to differentiate x with respect to t. So it really becomes an implicit type of differentiation technique, right, where you're going to be using uh, the chain rule throughout. In other words, any time that you come across a variable that's not a t, which is every time you're going to tack on, d, in this case, theta over dt. To top it off, you're going to use the product rule, aren't you? Because we have a product here. Um, you could distribute the cosine through if you thought that that was easier. It's really about the same level of difficulty. I'm going to keep it the way it is. So if we take the derivative of theta plus cosine theta with respect to t, we get d theta dt plus negative sine, which I could write as minus sine theta, and then we'll multiply by another d theta dt. That will be multiplied by our cosine theta. So we are halfway done with our product rule. Next you will add the theta plus cosine theta, and then we would multiply by the derivative of cosine theta with respect to t, of course. And so we get negative sine theta. And then we'll multiply by a d theta dt. 
Now, our job was to evaluate dx dt such that our theta was 5 pi over 6. What that simply says is that you're going to replace the theta with 5 pi over 6 every time you see it, but at the same time, keep in mind that d theta dt is defined as 1 over 2. So let's make both of those substitutions. d theta dt is 1 half. Sine of theta is now sine of 5 pi over 6. We'll worry about evaluating that later. I might put parentheses around all this so that I don't get it all mixed up. Notice that this d theta dt is not multiplying through. It's not like a distributive property. However, this cosine of theta would be, so we really want to use parentheses there. Maybe I'll even put that in parentheses to further emphasize it. We are going to add the quantity 1 half plus cosine of 5 pi over 6. And then that's going to be multiplied by the negative sine of 5 pi over 6. And then I finally have another instance of a 1 half back at the end there. And I could have done a couple of other things. I probably could have just uh, taken that minus sign all the way out to here and called this a subtraction problem, but this is going to work. Now, I, I really think that a student could enter this um, or could evaluate this by hand fairly easily. Um, it would just be tedious, but it is a calculator active problem. So let's go to our calculators and we're just going to enter this in. And I'll tell you what, it would be a, a great challenge for you to just to stop the video, pause it, and go ahead and enter this into your calculator just to make sure that you're placing the parentheses in the right spots and, and see if we do indeed get the same answer. Now, before I go to the calculator, I just noticed something. Take a look at this term right here, this one half. Notice I'm going to erase that. I'd like to change my mind on that one. The theta here should be replaced by a 5 pi over 6, right? I put a 1 half there. That's what a d theta dt is, but the theta itself is 5 pi over 6. Okay, let's move to the calculator and let's take a look. So here we are with the calculator, and to save a little bit of time, I've gone ahead and entered this uh, function this expression, I guess, to the best of my ability. And because it's such a long, robust function, I'm going to use a, a really cool feature of the TI Inspire uh, CXCast Premium Teacher Software, where I can change my view from document preview into computer view, which does a great job of handling a large amount of terms. Uh, within some kind of a computation. But it looks like I have all of the pieces where they should be. Uh, parentheses are justified correctly um, and whatnot. And if you wanted to double check your entry in case it was incorrect, I would definitely pause the video and see if you can uh, compare term by term. But I am getting an answer of negative 0.654, and that's the one that we're going to go with. So let's move back to the document. So here we are, we are going to say our approximation is negative 0.654. And I think we have one other little issue to address with this problem. And that is, interpret the meaning of your answer in the context of the problem. And I don't really want you to do anything a whole lot differently than what you did when you were working on interpretation of meanings. This was back in unit four. So what we're going to think about here is the fact that our particle has an x component to it and a y component to it. And it's this x component that's changing. It's actually decreasing. So what we can do is we can say, uh, for our interpretation is that the uh, particle uh, has an x-coordinate that's decreasing. So maybe we could just simply say the x-coordinate of the particle so we have the x-coordinate of the particle 
is decreasing. Let's write particle a little bit better there. at a rate of 0.654. Now notice, because I used the word decreasing, I do not want to put a negative sign in front of the 0.654. Um, also, I know that we normally like to use units Perhaps if you've watched previous videos of mine, I've emphasized the NUT, the NUT procedure where you use the noun or name with units and time. We just don't have the luxury to do that in this particular problem because we were not given units and time in this case. Uh, are there other ways that you could have expressed this? Maybe you could say something to the effect of the X coordinate is moving to the left at a rate. Of 0.654. That is conceivable, although it can be a little <clears throat> deceiving because this particle is not just solely moving left. It's got a combination of movement of left and, and downward, I believe. And I'm going to show you that. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. We can do something very cool with this on the graphing calculator. So let's move back to that and uh, see this in some uh, live performance. So here we go to my polar graphing template, and I'm going to sketch this, the graph of this polar function. And this polar function does go by the name of theta plus the cosine of theta. And we know that this is only sketched from 0 to 2 pi. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Enter, see what we've got. And we have a very cool curve. It's actually uh, formally called a spiral. There's an entire family of curves like this that are referred to as spirals. The spiral of Archimedes is one of the more famous ones. And then I want to set this in motion. I'd like to see where that point is when the theta value is pi over 6 and see if the dx dt is doing what we would predict it to do. So I want to know which spoke around this polar coordinate plane is 5 pi over 6. Well, since my spokes are in increments of pi over 12, 5 pi over 6 is the same as 10 pi over 12. So if I were to count quickly, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, I'm looking at this spoke right here that's kind of flashing. And then I'm going to go ahead and see if I could put some text in here. This would be pretty cool. And maybe I can label that as being theta equal to the fraction 5 pi over 6. All I'm doing is just putting some text in here, and I could even move that around, try to get that in a good spot. Well, right about there is probably as good as any, so that we can equate it to that spoke. Okay, I'm going to use the power of the TI Inspire CX2 to set this in motion, and I'm going to go into my menu, trace, and I'm going to use path plots. And I'm plotting, of course, a polar function. So I can push the play button, almost covered up my 30 equal 5 pi over 6, as long as I can see my 5 pi over 6. So I'm going to hit play, and here's what I want us to do. I want us to watch this point move along this curve and kind of isolate in what it's happening when it's right along this spoke right here. All right, so we're going to hit play. And we're moving towards that location. Oh, the excitement. And by the time I get there, which is right about there, and I'm going to stop it, it's easy to see that the horizontal motion component of this was going towards the left. Now, it also has a vertical component that's moving downward. And that's why together, this point is moving towards the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And that's where we get into the idea of vectors a little bit later on. But if we were just to isolate on the horizontal component, it's certainly decreasing. Right? The x value, and remember, we've got this x-coordinate plane back behind here so that we can rely on it. This point seems to be heading this way much more so than it is that way to the right. I also like to think about how this is analogous to an Etch-a-Sketch. If any one of you have ever played with an Etch-a-Sketch with the two knobs, when you move them simultaneously, you 
get your pen to draw something uh, a little bit more predict unpredictable than, say, just a straight vertical or something like that. But anyhow, that is what is happening with this particle motion. And it's kind of neat to see how you can embed so many different calculus concepts together. This problem is particle motion and polar. You're going to see a lot of applications of polar with area in some of the upcoming videos. So thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.